We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Hello to everyone and welcome to the UN Internet Governance Forum. Uh, this is the virtual session titled as One Click to Attack Critical Infrastructure and What Can We Do About This? Today we organize a two-part workshop to discuss various elements of critical infrastructure protection with a focus on international cooperation component. Um, my name is Anastasia Kazakova. I'm a senior public affairs manager at Kaspersky, working with global cyber diplomacy projects. I'm really happy to be your moderator today. And with us, my colleague, Arnaud Duchul, public affairs manager Europe at Kaspersky, who will be a remote moderator to interact with you in the chat. A quick note before we start about the housekeeping rules, please do not hesitate to share your views and use the chat for that. We will be hearing first um, the views of the experts, and then after that we will also try to, mock, to take the most interesting questions uh, to address them additionally to the all experts. I'm now really excited to launch um, the part number one and start first with um, national uh, approaches to the critical infrastructure protection and discuss what could be the ways to conceptualize a critical infrastructure protection policy framework. We are really honored to have with us today um, the four speakers for the first part. Um, and just to introduce all of them, uh, first we will be having the ambassador, Regent Greenberger from Federal Foreign Office of Germany. Then also Daniel Klingele, a senior advisor at the International Security Division of the Federal Department of the Foreign Affairs Switzerland. Mr. Dan Yok Hau, Assistant Chief Executive at National Cyber Resilience at the Cybersecurity Agency of Singapore. And Ms. Joanna Weaver, Director of the Tech Policy Design Center at Australian National University and a former head of the Australian delegations to the UN Open Ended Working Group and a group of governmental experts. So we, as you can see, we tried really to invite the experts representing different um, regions and different countries approaches to hear really diverse views and understand what is actually now the key elements in regulating critical infrastructure protection. For the first part, we have three key main questions, and I'd like to address the first one to um, first to learn about the national perspectives. What are the key elements in national regulatory approaches to protect critical infrastructure? And what's really interesting, how countries see now what is critical and what is not critical, especially after the first wave of the pandemic. I'm really happy to um, pass the floor first to Ambassador Greenberger, then to um, Mr. Klingele, Mr. Dunn, and uh, Ms. Joanna Viva. Thank you, Anastasia. Um, I start with, uh, I mean, the, the task here uh, is conceptualizing how um, critical infrastructure pro uh, protection policy framework could work. I start with showing how we do it in Germany. Uh, so our national approach, and then how it is embedded in uh, EU uh, in the EU framework, because this is of course a regulatory framework that is very important for us. And then I mention uh, something uh, about our international cooperation, but I leave uh, the UN framework, so the global framework, to the speakers from Singapore, um, Switzerland, and also to Johanna, who are all three of them are championing. Uh, the UN Global Framework, so uh, I align with them, I think, but I will not mention it in my contribution. So um, Germany is a big country, it's a transit country, it's a big market economy, which also means that also critical infrastructure is in private hands, but um, that's perhaps a speciality in, in Germany, we have a federal system, which means that some of the critical infrastructure is, uh, uh, the owners are the lenders or the regional level, the regional entities, or also municipalities. Uh, we have eight neighboring countries, uh, nine neighboring countries, eight EU countries plus uh, Switzerland. So these are the, the circumstances uh, which lead us to um, something what we call um, a whole of government and whole of society approach to uh, critical infrastructure protection. Uh, 
Um, essential elements of this are that we um, observe a close public-private uh, cooperation with intense uh, information sharing also on best practices and lessons learned. Um, we try to continuously improve the cybersecurity level. So this is uh, this means that our, our architecture is not static, but dynamic. Um, we monitor very closely the development of the threat uh, situation, especially to with regard to cyber threats. We have a national uh, cyber defense center for that. And um, the priority, um, uh, priority support is given to critical infrastructure operators by our authorities. For example, we have a mobile incident response team. The national framework is basically uh, consisting of, let's say, four uh, important things. Um, the first one is a law on um, on uh, security of networks, it's uh, it created a cyber security agency, the BSI, and uh, there is also a directive on critical infrastructure as the legal framework for the cyber security of critical infrastructures. This has been in place for several years, but is updated from time to time. It has been updated also um, this year also in reaction to uh, the increasing uh, threats that we have seen and uh, experienced during uh, the pandemic where everybody uh, relied heavily on, on a digital environment. And uh, we, we, we saw also, but we saw on the other hand that also the incidents were um, increasing or the number was rising. According to these specifications, uh, critical infrastructure operators must regularly implement and demonstrate technical and organizational mm, measures for IT security. Both at federal and state levels, uh, there are coordination offices for critical infrastructure, which are tasked with coordinating and networking uh, measures. Then the second element is a critical infrastructure strategy, which summarizes the objectives, the threat situation and the areas of voluntary commitment and responsibility for both government and business stakeholders. Um, here in this uh, directive or in this strategy, also our neighbors, the EU, the G7 and NATO are mentioned as most important partners for our national uh, critical infrastructure protection. Then we have a cybersecurity strategy. It uh, has been uh, reviewed this year and was um, agreed on in August 2021. This is a public uh, document because it mirrors this uh, whole of society approach and it, it gives tasks to all the stakeholders that are responsible or that are contributing to cybersecurity. So to the private sector, to uh, the civil society, to the technical community, to academia, and also to the government on both uh, national and federal level. Then you've heard perhaps about our IT security law, which is uh, the law that was under discussion when we discussed also how to, um, how to speed up um, the deployment of the 5G networks in Germany. It's, it is the law that strengthens also our cybersecurity agency and gives it um, uh, authority, for example, in detection and defense uh, against cyber attacks, the security of mobile networks, consumer protection, security for companies, and security, cybersecurity certification. So when we look now at the European level, we have just uh, last Friday had an agreement um, uh, among the member states on a new network and information security directive. It's also an update from a, a former directive, but uh, we have also seen the need to, for example, um, uh, intensify our efforts to protect critical infrastructure. So um, this um, uh, network and security, information security directive, it's NIS and NIS 2 now, um, the council has agreed on it. Now it's going uh, uh, into the negotiations with uh, parliament. Um, and we implement this European uh, regulation by our national regulation. 
uh, perhaps uh, some elements also of our international uh, cooperation. So beyond uh, the European level, I would like to mention the counter ransomware initiative. This is an American initiative where uh, Germany joined and I'm personally leading uh, the diplomatic track within this initiative. It is a really groundbreaking uh, new step in harnessing international expertise and political resolve to defeat ransomware threats. Um, in the diplomatic track, um, we finalize uh, at the moment um, uh, a mapping of ongoing multilateral um, uh, formats and um, discussion and negotiation processes. Uh, and we want to define also areas where enhanced collab uh, collaboration among the participating states could be useful. Uh, we want to encourage all states to actively fight ransomware criminal groups. Ransomware is a cross-border phenomenon, so no nation state can do it alone. Um, I will leave it at this, but I'm happy to join the discussion later. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think that the part of the answer was also covering the first question about the um, expectations from the private sector, looking at the also domestic, the EU perspective. So thank you so much for the structured response to this. Um, now the floor to, um, to Mr. Klingler. Also would be really grateful to keep the remarks shorter to make sure that we will hear in all experts. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Anastasia. Uh, thank you for inviting us to this um, workshop. Unfortunately, Nadine, who should have taken part, uh, uh, cannot because she felt ill uh, this morning. Um, so she asked me to replace her. Um, well, as you also mentioned, unfortunately, the protection of critical infrastructures against attacks since peacetime has become increasingly urgent in recent years. And as the title of this workshop aptly puts it, um, critical infrastructure can be attacked and damaged from afar with the click of a button. Uh, and this year we have seen a sharp increase in such incidents, uh, including some spectacular uh, attacks like on the col colonial pipeline. And I think that uh, again makes everybody aware how important it is to protect um, critical infrastructure and take measures uh, in that regard. Um, well, in Switzerland, um, we have a strategy on the protection of critical infrastructure. The first one was adopted in 2012 by the government. Uh, the second one in 2018. It's from 2018 and 2022. Um, and it defines uh, critical infrastructure as processes, systems and facilities that are essential for the functioning of the economy, for the well-being of the population. And that can include energy supply, passenger and freight transport and medical care. And as we have seen uh, during the pandemic, uh, medical care has really uh, come up high on the agenda because of uh, many uh, very, very uh, worrying attacks on the health sector. So, so this has been uh, even before the pandemic already a part of the critical infrastructure as our government has um, uh, decided it. Um, the key approach is in national regulatory frameworks will be dictated by different elements. And generally speaking, in Switzerland, we follow the approach of rather deregulated markets for critical sectors. Uh, this means a regulatory approach has to keep in mind the costs which will stem from regulatory requirements. In general, there should be always a balance between regulation and incentives. In Switzerland, we see the protection of critical infrastructures as a cross-cutting task which interfaces with various policy areas and tasks, like energy policy, security policy, protection against natural hazards, and, and so on. Accordingly, critical infrastructure protection takes place within the framework of decentralized structures and responsibilities, as Switzerland is also a federal state uh, like Germany, and uh, like Regina just mentioned before, a okay, example. And as for the defini definition of critical infrastructure providers, Switzerland has an inventory which focuses rather on critical functions than just on organizational level. Stakeholders who consider themselves to be operating a critical infrastructure can contact the National Center for Cybersecurity and ask to be included in the inventory. Um, to give you an example, some time ago, a company that produces security paper for banknotes approached our National Center for Cybersecurity 
And after some discussion and after they showed uh, to this um, uh, NCSC what they do and why they think they're critical, they were accepted uh, and included into the inventory. Um, this inventory is holistic in nature, not only focusing on the information assurance part of critical infrastructure providers, but with increased digitalization of processes, it also becomes clear that such things as managed service providers for critical infrastructure providers grow in importance. So we also have uh, companies that uh, provide services. And I think uh, the solar winds attack was a wake up call in that regard and probably made uh, we think um, in some countries uh, what critical infrastructure should be and, and what should be in an inventory. And I think the inventory itself, uh, well, it, it's not enough to have uh, decided what is regarded as critical infrastructure or not. Um, you need also a process then, what to do and what does it mean um, for uh, these uh, providers. And a, a friend of mine working in the NCS just gave me one uh, example. I think it's a very good one. He said in one country, he spoke to, to one of the heads of the cybersecurity authority and he told him that he could decide if he wanted that his pen is a critical infrastructure. Uh, he has the authority to do that. But that is not enough. You have then to decide what does that mean for this pen? Who can use the pen and what you do if you don't use the pen? You put it in a safe and so on. So, so just uh, deciding is not enough. You need really the processes and the measures and the whole structure, what you do. And that is also part of our strategy. I can maybe talk, talk a little bit more on that when, uh, when we talk about the, the second uh, of your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think it's really interesting also looking not only at the critical uh, functions, but also on the use case and whether those uh, critical services um, can be used and how it could impact the regulatory approaches in this regard. Um, I'm passing the floor to Mr. Dunn to hear the perspective about um, the Singapore's approach in this regard. Yep. Thank you, uh, Anastasia. And thank you to uh, Kaspersky uh, for convening this workshop and for inviting the uh, Cybersecurity Agency of Singapore uh, to share our perspective on this uh, subject. So let me first begin, begin by uh, sharing uh, how uh, our perspective on uh, CII protection in Singapore. So in Singapore, uh, protecting the critical information infrastructure, or what we call the uh, CII for short, is a national priority. Uh, and we make use of our um, and the uh, we have a law that mandates uh, uh, CII operators uh, to protect uh, these systems and for CSA to be the authority uh, to manage the protection of these systems. And our focus is really in uh, ensuring that there is no loss or compromise uh, of the computer or computer systems uh, necessary to ensure the continuous supply of essential services. So in Singapore, we have identified 11 critical uh, infrastructure sectors. Uh, they are the usual uh, familiar sectors, things like energy, water, uh, banking and finance, healthcare, transport, which include, uh, includes the air, land and sea sectors, uh, also infocom, media, uh, security, emergency services, and the government sector. These sectors provide services that are essential to the national security, defense, foreign relations, uh, economy, and uh, public safety and public order uh, to the citizens of Singapore. So given the unique uh, historical and uh, social political circumstances of uh, each country, we think that uh, states should have the prerogative to designate CII at the national level. So in our case in Singapore, what we do is that the, the CSA, we work closely with the uh, various sector regulator. So for each sector uh, that I mentioned earlier, there's a sector regulator. So CSA worked closely with the sector regulator to determine what are the impact criteria uh, that would disrupt or cause a, a, a grave uh, debilitating effect to the essential services. Uh, we, first of all, uh, determine the criteria and then we will jointly perform an impact assessment to identify the systems that meets the impact criteria. Through this, those systems uh, that are considered essential providing essential services will be designated as CII by the commissioner, okay, by the commissioner of cybersecurity, okay, which in this case is also the uh, chief executive of the cybersecurity agency of Singapore. To manage uh, this uh, CII, we have established a cybersecurity act 
a key piece of our legislation for the oversight and maintenance of uh, national cybersecurity in Singapore. And the key emphasis of this act, as I mentioned, is to uh, ensure protection of CII against uh, cyber attacks. The act has three key objectives. Firstly, is to strengthen the protection of CII against uh, cyber attacks. Secondly, is to authorize CSA as the national agency to prevent and respond to cybersecurity threats and incidents. And thirdly, to establish a licensing framework for cybersecurity service providers. One of uh, the key focus as part of my job is to ensure that our CII remains resilient in the face of a cyber attack. Whenever there's a breach of a cyber incident, reporting of cyber incident are mandatory for CII owners. The Cybersecurity Act set out a framework for CSA to be informed and if need to, to request for information on CII during investigations. The CSA will also work with the CII sector regulators and CII owners during investigations to determine the best course of action. And of course, our focus is on balancing between operational efficiency, impact to businesses, and of course, uh, operational investigations. As cybersecurity threat increased in severity and uh, sophistication, uh, organizations will need to recognize that it is not a matter of if, but when they will be breached. And uh, our uh, cybersecurity framework takes into account the full suite of uh, what uh, is commonly known as the IPDRR framework, the Identify, Protect, Detect, Response and Recover framework uh, to ensure the resiliency of uh, CII in providing essential services. And we also believe that adopting a threat and a risk-based approach on cybersecurity uh, is a sustainable and ref, uh, relevant approach towards uh, cyber, uh, managing cyber risk. I will be, I, I think I will stop here. I'll be happy to discuss uh, these issues in greater detail later if there's uh, further interest on this issue. Thank you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, again, for providing the domestic perspective and also quite really structured um, in a structured way. Um, and I'm passing the floor to Ms. Joanna Viva to share the perspective um, from Australia. Thanks, Anastasia, um, and lovely to see so many colleagues uh, joining in today. Um, I just wanted to, rather than give a full overview of uh, the Australian framework, I thought I'd touch on some legislation that passed through our parliament uh, just in November. And this is a legislation specifically designed around security of critical infrastructure. So it passed uh, less than a month ago. That legislation has four key provisions that will be of interest uh, here. The first is that it extended the definition of critical infrastructure in Australia from four to 11 sectors. And so those sectors include all of the, the things that you would expect it to include, power, water, transport, fuel, et cetera. Interestingly for many involved in this discussion, it also did specifically designate the domain name system as critical infrastructure in Australia, um, as well as things like superannuation assets. So um, we have quite considerably expanded the definition. Um, and then to go to David's point about, um, you know, who gets to decide if the pen is critical infrastructure, what, it, what, what are the obligations that then arise from that? The new legislation that we've passed has uh, implements uh, three specific requirements. One is reporting requirements um, and uh, the establishment of a register of critical infrastructure assets. Um, and this includes reporting requirements around things like foreign ownership. So it really has uh, increased uh, and extended those existing reporting requirements. It mandates cybersecurity incident reporting for our critical infrastructure providers. So if you have uh, significant cyber incidents happening on critical infrastructure uh, in Australia and it's designated in these sectors, it's now mandatory to report that to the Australian Cybersecurity Centre. And then uh, the fourth element of it, which is, um, I think, quite unique is that um, we have um, legislated government assistance measures. So this means that if there is a cybersecurity incident happening on critical infrastructure, and the language here is important, that seriously prejudices Australia's prosperity, national security or defence, then the government now has the power to mandatorily take control of that infrastructure uh, to be um, responding and mitigating to that cyber incident. So as far as I'm aware, the only other country that has powers at, at quite that level of, of 
of basically ministerial direction uh, to for the government to take control of the infrastructure uh, is France. So uh, ANSI, the, the French cybersecurity agency has a similar power. Um, but it is a considerable step up in Australia. It's not without controversy, uh, in particular, the fact that it, there isn't necessarily the provision around judicial review of that ministerial direction. Um, so it's something um, that, that uh, I'm sure there will be a lot more discussion on. It really goes to uh, the point on question three about what do you do when there is a major cybersecurity incident as well. So happy to talk about that more as we go on. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, really interesting. I think about the extension of the definition of what is not considered as a critical infrastructure sector. We also see the same trend in the European Union with the updating of the EU NIS directive and inclusion of the managed service providers and the cloud providers, for instance, also as a part of the critical infrastructure. So it's definitely could be also the trend that we will see in other jurisdictions too. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'd like also to merge the second and the third question right now and to also narrow down them and probably again to pass the floor to Ms. Greenberger and ask how um, is it possible to share how those particular norms of the critical infrastructure protection from the UN cyber stability framework coexist with the domestic efforts? And in the event of the cyber attack, um, beyond the, the private sector who might own the ICT infrastructure, critical infrastructure, what are the expectations from the government to other private actors? And here, of course, um, I would also re to refer to the security researchers, to incident response responders, private search, and many others that also could be private and it could also be part of the global um, response at the national level. Um, okay, um, Anastasia, could you repeat your first question, please? I had a problem to understand. Sure, sure. Um, apologies for that. Um, how those norms from the UN Cyber Stability Framework, at least two norms on the critical infrastructure, coexist with the domestic efforts in this regard? And that would greatly help to understand us how are those actually implemented at the national level? Thank you. Okay, uh, the UN norms um, are a very generic uh, framework. So um, what we do on the national level is uh, we try to have something in place that solves our day-to-day -day problems and is uh, in line with this uh, global framework. So for example, um, certs uh, in the UN framework have to be apolitical. And this is, for example, something that we can provide for in our national legislation. So um, uh, we have, I mean, we have 42 certs in Germany. So it's a rather complex uh, system, but all of them are, of course, available also for cross-border uh, incident resolution. Um, I would like to, with regard to what is, um, what, what is, how is the uh, responsibility of private sector and government sector balanced? I would raise, I would like to raise um, also a question for discussion. I would like to hear also your comments, because. Um, um, we have, of course, uh, to define what is critical infrastructure, and uh, jo Johanna mentioned of, uh, already uh, the issue of sectors, and also uh, Dan did this, which sectors are critical infrastructure, but, but we have also um, the, um, another criteria that could be size of critical infrastructure, size of infrastructure, and therefore it becomes critical infrastructure, and size could be financial turnover and could be number of users. And that is, um, that is something that uh, also on the European level, we are taking up uh, this idea of uh, size as a criterion for being critical as soon as many, many people rely on a certain infrastructure for their daily lives, it becomes critical in, in a way. So, um, of course, uh, there is also the sectorial aspect, and this is something that the government, of course, focuses on. It's responsible for, uh, you know, water, energy, waste, and so on. So this is an absolutely a critical infrastructure. But um, yeah, with regard to information infrastructure, a lot more becomes uh, critical because people rely on it uh, in their daily lives. And for example, mobile telecom networks. Uh, I don't know, 10 years ago, it was a luxury. Now it's an essential. So uh, this is also uh, 
something that we have to discuss and we have to discuss it with with the private sector because as soon as they are defined critical infrastructure there are heavy burdens for them uh, with regard uh, to their relation to the government institutions thank you thank you very much um daniel would you like also to share the perspective of the Switzerland here uh, yes of course um well, the, the report, uh, the Open End Working Group report, and, and uh, in particular the report of the GGE, they give quite uh, valuable guidance on how to implement the norms, uh, uh, in particular on the protection of critical infrastructure. Um, the GGE report uh, mentions, for example, the General Assembly Resolution 58-199 on the creation of a global culture of cybersecurity and the protection of critical information infrastructure and the annex highlights actions they can take to that end and i think that's uh, quite a good start for, for many states to look at that and, and see what could they do what action could they take if they don't have yet um, done so um, uh, as i mentioned before a, a good step in, in our view is to um, to to implement these voluntary norms is to the development of a national strategy and ideally this strategy is developed with all the stakeholders um, that uh, run for example critical infrastructures um, as i said we have this uh, national strategy on the protection of critical infrastructure which is also linked to the national cybersecurity strategy uh, which is in place uh, and this strategy defines 17 measures which, with which the government tends to maintain the security of supply in Switzerland and improve it in key areas. And among other things, it has given the respective supervisory and regulatory authorities responsible the mandate to examine in all critical infrastructure sectors whether there are significant risk of serious supply disruptions. And in addition, measures are to be taken to reduce such risks. And under certain circumstances, it may be necessary to adapt the sectoral legal uh, foundations, uh, laws, for example, energy law, traffic law, and so on. Um, we are, uh, on the one hand, active in establishing and developing more in-depth collaboration between critical infrastructure providers and government entities in the field of cybersecurity, such as the NCSC, as I men mentioned. And on the other hand, Switzerland stands as a small and independent nation that acting against threats or malicious network activities originating from its territory is absolutely key. So not only regard to secure our critical infrastructure providers, but also to contribute to the international effort to quench such activities early on in order to avoid damages to other nations' critical infrastructure providers. And to achieve this, Switzerland is active in numerous international groups and fora, from purely technical ones like cybersecurity incident response, uh, response team focus groups to such platforms as the GFCE in the cyber capacity building domain. Because we think it's also, of course, important to help other countries to uh, build up their capacities. And as mentioned, also uh, having a trustworthy collaborative and broad exchange between critical infrastructure providers and the government is key. Uh, the network of relevant stakeholders must be established early on and continuously strengthened in order to function in case of an outtake or an attack. So the focus must lay on building up such public-private partnerships early on to allow for efficient support. And however, from a Swiss point of view, it is important to understand that at the end of the day, the providers of critical infrastructures must understand the responsibilities and duties, as even the best network and partnership cannot replace a sound and robust managing of cyber risks within the respective organization or enterprise. So it's really a shared responsibility um, that we are trying to implement. And this also means that corresponding capaci capacities must be made available. It is also worthwhile for critical infrastructure operators to prepare for the worst possible incident and that crisis communication networks are maintained and tested regularly. If public private networks are established and functioning and every actor knows what to do in an emergency, attacks can be mitigated or fought more easily and negative effects can be avoided. And that's basically the approach you're trying to, to implement. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, interesting, um, the use of the phrase, the shared responsibility, um, and how it actually is also the balance, quite interesting to look at the at this, this approach, especially given that it's uh, the confederation is the different approaches that the 
and a more the federa federation level here. Uh, Mr. Dan, would you also like to provide the view of the Singapore? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so I think on the first questions of the UN norms, uh, maybe uh, let me just say that uh, Singapore sees the UN as an important and uh, inclusive platform uh, that offers countries, uh, both big and small, an opportunity to come together uh, to discuss about the uh, developments of rules and norms for international peace and security in cyberspace. Uh, it is also a platform uh, to enhance uh, cyber cooperation. Uh, so the successful conclusion of the uh, inaugural OEWG and the uh, six uh, UNGGE last year uh, are significant achievements. Um, so specifically on the implementing of the uh, this uh, non-binding norms and the confidence building measures, uh, we would like to share uh, three key areas that we think are important uh, to enhance global cooperation in cyberspace. And uh, the three areas uh, can be aptly summarized into the three C's in our views. Uh, so the consensus, collaborations, and uh, capabilities. So the first C on consensus. So while much progress has been achieved uh, in these landmark reports uh, by OEWG and GGE, uh, sorry, this year, uh, we think that more can be done to broaden the consensus on the existing areas of uh, divergence. So um, we need to uh, discuss to, this, uh, to ensure that there's consensus, to develop what are the uh, so-called rules of the roads. Uh, it's important for countries to uh, put aside their differences and to work on the common areas and to, to ensure that there's a consensus of what the norms are. Secondly, uh, we think there's a need to collaborate uh, to keep the digital uh, domain safe and secure. Okay? Uh, as we all know, the cyberspace transcends uh, physical boundaries and uh, many systems uh, spans across different countries and the countries need to collaborate closely uh, to ensure that uh, we can respond effectively as a system to cyber threats. So um, lastly, on the, um, the countries must invest in uh, developing capabilities, uh, both at the, uh, in, in, within the country, as well as to ensure that uh, we help other countries to develop their capabilities so that uh, there is a systemic response uh, to cybersecurity. So, okay, so moving on to the second question on the protection of uh, critical infrastructure. Uh, I think our keyword here uh, on uh, protection of uh, critical infrastructure, I think our keyword is uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a team, it's a team effort. Uh, government do not necessarily have a monopoly on the solutions to uh, cyber challenges. Uh, no single country or no single stakeholder will be able to take on the full responsibility of ensuring cyber security of its uh, CII. It is a collective responsibility uh, of all stakeholders, including the government, the critical infrastructure operator, as well as the private sector. However, government should take the lead in strengthening cross-sectorial cooperation, given that the weakest link can provide an entry point, not just to a specific uh, system, but can cause a knock-on effects that affect other sectors and the whole country too. So in Singapore, uh, what we do is that we regularly conduct nationwide cyber crisis management exercises uh, to improve our crisis response capabilities and readiness to respond promptly and effectively to cyber attacks. We bring together all the 11 uh, critical information infrastructure sectors uh, in a national concerted effort to test and validate their operational plans in response to complex attack scenarios with realistic simulations of multi-dimensional cyber threats. Uh, in addition, cyber threats are not confined within uh, geographical boundaries, and we think that bilateral and multilateral operational cooperation are key to share timely information and respond to incidents uh, swiftly. Singapore will build on these efforts and work more closely with our partners to collectively combat cross-border cyber threats. We recognize that the urgency of highlighting the threats uh, is important to protect CII. And uh, disrupting or undermining the operations of CII will likely impair the delivery of critical services to population and cause detrimental effects uh, to the, at the domestic, regional, international level. In this regard, we are glad that the uh, consensus report of the six GGE and the inaugural OEWG have recognized the fundamental importance and the need to protect uh, this cross-border CII when developing an additional layer of understandings for norms 13F and G. Yep. Um, 
yeah, and I think yeah, that's all I have for this. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Dan. I agree with you, especially the last um, DG report actually provided quite a, an additional layer of understanding how those norms could be elaborated. And it was really helpful um, at, at, to us as a private sector as well to understand how states view them, what the particular measures are recommended to other states. And thus, I think also recommended implicitly to the private sector and owners of critical infrastructure to do to protect the critical infrastructure. I pass the floor to Joanna as well to hear the view from um, Australia. But before, I also really um, just like to highlight, we will be happy to hear your questions. Do not hesitate to ask them in the chat. I see many people in the room physically attending and uh, listening to us. So we will be welcoming your questions as well. Thank you. Um, I um, just wanted to emphasize with the recent uh, UN uh, agreements um, that passed through uh, the General Assembly uh, just a couple of months ago, um, where they were agreed earlier in the year, the key takeouts for those who aren't intimately involved in those discussions is that we have now unanimously agreed, every country in the world has agreed to two norms relating to critical infrastructure. I mean, I've agreed to 11, but relating to critical infrastructure, there are two in particular. One, we're not going to intentionally damage the critical infrastructure of other states using ICTs. And the other is saying that you should protect your critical infrastructure from ICTs. So the significance of the agreements earlier in the year at, at the UN is saying every country in the world agrees that we need to do this. And that is actually quite a significant milestone. Then in the GGE report, um, in addition to the OEWG report, which is every country in the world saying, yes, this is a good idea, we have um, now the additional layer of understanding and additional guidance on, well, what does it mean when you say, let's not damage the critical infrastructure of another state? So it provides much more, you know, we have this high level statement, the new GGE report provides a lot more detail. It also provides some suggestions for countries. If you're looking at, you know, how do you protect your critical infrastructure, go and have a look at that report because it's a great starting point. In terms of what uh, countries are doing and how you can uh, implement this, with respect to the first one, and I would love to see more of this, there are not enough countries in the world making public commitments that they are not going to intentionally damage the critical infrastructure of other states. We know there are many countries out there who have and are developing offensive cyber capabilities, including Australia. Australia, however, is one of the few countries that publicly commits that we're not going to use those capabilities to intentionally damage the critical infrastructure of another states. We need more transparency around this. We cannot keep allowing these capabilities to be developed uh, in, uh, in the shadows. Um, obviously, parts of this will remain classified, but in the same way we disclose we have warships, we can disclose the fact that we use those warships in accordance with the rules that we've all agreed. We can disclose the fact that we have these offensive cyber tools and agree and commit to use them in accordance with the rules. Um, with respect to uh, how you implement the protection of the critical infrastructure one, well, the example that we gave uh, earlier with the Australian critical uh, infrastructure legislation that's just passed is an example of that and, and many of the other things that colleagues have spoken of uh, touch on those points as well. Um, the other thing I would say is, yes, these norms are voluntary, um, but countries have now committed to act in accordance with them. That's the significance of the agreement that came out of the UN earlier this year. Um, they are also supported by binding international law. So we, you know, it's not just voluntary norms. These are many concepts that are also reinforced by binding international law. And we need more countries not just to talk the talk at the UN. We need more countries to walk the walk and actually act in accordance with the commitments that they're making. Thank you. Thank you so much. Really interesting, um, especially to my personal perspective, binding international law and unbinding norms, it's always the question how they coexist um, and looking at a more how practically states already, what they do really actually helps to have a better understanding of this and probably within the, yep. I would just say the GG and the OEWG reports are really good on this point as well. Mm -hmm. They make it really clear that international law and norms complement each other, that the norms do not change any of the existing binding obligations that you have as a state. They help us to understand what those some of those obligations may be. So norms and international law operate 
concurrently. And I'd encourage people to look at the GGE and the OEWG report, which provides really good commentary to help understand how the two coexist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you so much, Joanna, for this. If anyone would also like to reflect to the remarks, yes, please. I just want to add to something that uh, Johanna said, uh, one or two ideas. Uh, the first one is that the states are obliged to protect their critical infrastructure is also a big challenge uh, on the human resources and something that um, is uh, often not uh, really considered as a serious challenge is a serious challenge, which means do we have enough experts and cybersecurity experts and human resource literate to protect uh, critical infrastructure in, in our societies. And this starts you know, from primary schools to university. Uh, we have to make sure that we have enough um, people who are able to do this. And um, then uh, something that uh, Daniel said is also important for us, this is cyber capacity building. And there we have in the, um, in the OEWG report, a very important sentence, which is, that cyber capacity building is not a one-way street, but a two-way street, which means that, especially in, in this field, when it comes to implementing the norms on critical infrastructure, we need to cooperate closely so that on, let's say, uh, all the partners who share a certain, for example, uh, information network, uh, communication network, um, take part in this cyber capacity building effort so that all sides are uh, able to do their responsibility to follow their responsibility in protecting the infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you so much. We agree about the two-way street of the capacity building. And what's even more, I would even add that um, within the UN cyber stability framework, because I understood um, sub capacity building is the bad helping some states to the um, less developed states, but I think there could be also the way how the private sector might be um, helping to other states and the other private sectors, especially small and medium businesses. Um, so this is also one of the way to look what is going on in terms of the cyber efforts in this regard. Yeah, just an example, for example, uh, Ukraine. Of course, everybody is speaking about Nord Stream 2, but there are actually some other pipelines running through Ukraine to Central Europe. And um, we are working with Ukraine in, in terms of cyber capacity building to set up a better framework for protecting this, this infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Daniel, would you like to also respond? Uh, yes, I just uh, also wanted to add, well, of, of course, I, I support everything Johanna said on, on the relation uh, between norms and, and international law, and, and the reports really uh, have quite good language on that, uh, everybody can, can go and, and read that, and I just wanted to add that, um, well, the obligation or say that the norm that you should protect your critical infrastructure is, of course, very important, but I would also like to highlight the other one that you should um, if there is a request from, for assistance uh, by another state, that you should try and help uh, that state, of course, uh, with, with the, the means that are available to yourself. And, and our approach uh, in Switzerland is that um, on the technical level, with the certs, um, they, they, they help uh, everybody. Um, if we get a request uh, also from a state that we usually maybe don't regard as our closest friends, um, if there is really a, 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 an attack on the critical infrastructure in that country, um, if we get enough information from that state that, well, the technical the information we need to, to be able to, to help them, then, then we do that. And I think that is also really important that there is a good cooperation on a technical level between states, between certs, which is not politicized, but really trying to help uh, uh, mitigate effects and uh, malicious um, activities on, on in, the, in the cyberspace. Yeah. Thank you. Um, about this aspect, also thank you for uh, building the bridge to the second part about the international component, where actually the norm H about the request and assistance would be the core to look at. Um, but also, I, the whole participants, uh, I'd like also to um, pay attention to the one of the sessions previously taken at the IGF about the law of neutrality and how actually if the sum of the private sector is and even states can have this neutral status to mitigate the cyber incident 
despite the political or geopolitical context. This I will also share the link here um, that has been actually organized by the ATH for Zurich. It's really interesting discussion um, taking place at the IGF. Concluding the part number one, I also want to narrow down even more the very question. And, and I assume that it will be difficult to give the answer ABC uh, for the one or two minute, but uh, keeping the same order, in the event of the cyber incident, and keeping in mind that this is for the government to provide the institutional framework, but uh, the private sector might own this infrastructure, what would be the recommended course of action for the critical infrastructure operators and the private sector broadly? And here, I, of course, refer to security researchers, the company that I represent, or the private incident respond respondents, and many more. So maybe to start first, with Mr. Dunn and then to Ambassador Greenberger, um, to Daniel and Joanna. Yeah. So I think in the event of uh, any uh, incidents, I think the, the, the keyword I would uh, repeat is what I said earlier. The key uh, thing is about uh, teamwork and working together, collaboration to respond to any uh, cybersecurity incidents. Uh, and in Singapore, we stress that a lot. Uh, the expectation uh, is not that uh, because you are a CII operator, and therefore, uh, you are alone uh, to face the uh, threat when, uh, when, you, when you face, uh, uh, when you uh, hit with an incident. Uh, in the first place, the government will lay down the institutional framework. Uh, in our case, uh, under the Cybersecurity Act, we will uh, have certain, uh, uh, we have the power to mandate them to take certain measures. Uh, and of course, uh, when, when an incident happened, uh, we will, uh, they will report the incident to us and the Cybersecurity Agency of Singapore. And we will draw on any, in fact, we will draw on uh, any resources from other parts of the government when necessary to support any of the uh, uh, critical infrastructure operators uh, if they need the help. Of course, uh, we bearing in mind that the private uh, operators, uh, they would have, uh, if they're operating critical infrastructure, they would have put in place some organic uh, capabilities uh, to defend the system. But uh, sometimes when they meet uh, pretty advanced, uh, very advanced threats, uh, the government would have no hesitation to lean forward, to provide the support. And it's all about teamwork, uh, working, uh, together and ensuring that we have an understanding uh, even before incident happen, confidence building measures and to work out the processes uh, before incident happen so that when something happens, uh, the, the team effort uh, effect uh, will, come, uh, will come into play. And that's our key focus. Thanks. Thank you so much. Ambassador Greenberger. Well, the, the responsibility of, of the government is basically to provide for the framework so uh, to set up national rules and also international cooperation uh, with regard to malicious state actors, especially, of course, that's also a diplomatic uh, responsibility. But with regard to cyber criminals, um, it's uh, also uh, uh, the responsibility uh, to cooperate in law enforcement with other, with other governments and jurisdictions. Um, otherwise, it's the private uh, owners of uh, critical infrastructure who are responsible. Of course, uh, as, as, uh, as in the case of Singapore, also in our case, our cybersecurity agency is helping, but it's the private uh, owner's responsibility. And with the new uh, European uh, NIS direct directive, we will even have fines if the private owners of critical infrastructure do not observe the minimum standards of critical infrastructure protections or cybersecurity protection. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Daniel? Well, uh, really short, I, I could echo what uh, Mr. Dan and <laughs> Inspector just said. It's, it's the same situation in Switzerland. Um, I, I mentioned it before, it's, it's in our view really a shared responsibility. Um, everybody has to know its responsibilities and duties, be prepared, processes should be in place. Uh, and then uh, in, in, when uh, really incidents occur in, uh, on critical infrastructure, uh, that this network really uh, plays out of, uh, and works. And of course, the government and, and the NCSC, they support um, the, the, the industry and private actors. But uh, the first responsibility lies with them if uh, their uh, critical infrastructure structure is attacked. Uh, maybe also that this is a state-owned infrastructure, then of course the responsibility is uh, with, with the state or the cantons in Switzerland. But I, I, I can just uh, well, really support what, what uh, both my predecessors just said. Yeah. Thank you so much. And Joanna, Joanna, please. 
Sure, uh, and uh, I've just saw Iona's uh, question uh, popping up as well, which I'll, I'll uh, address. So I think there's two things. One, um, it, when it comes to a, a cyber incident response against critical infrastructure, we're assuming this is going to have widespread impacts on the public, right? Because it's critical infrastructure. And if we've got our designations of critical infrastructure right, that means this is serious. It has impact on people's lives. So the first thing is that we must have pre-existing plans. Uh, you must have pre-existing relationships, both with government, so those aspects of the government agencies that will help during a particular um, cyber incident response of a significant scale, but also an incident management plan, and often that will be the private sector. Um, the private sector may be the ones that get called in to respond to those incidents. So have a plan and a pre-existing relationship with the key stakeholders. The second thing I would say is exercise um, critical infrastructure incidents as part of national emergency response plans. So most countries have national emergency response plans for what happens if there is some critical crisis that shuts down your country. Make sure that that also includes cyber attacks on your critical infrastructure. And in my experience, it very rarely does. There's this perception that an incident against critical infrastructure, cyber incidents against critical infrastructure needs to have this whole different complicated structure to go from the critical infrastructure provider up to you know the prime minister or the president of your country and um, it's just not true if if we have one of these significant cyber incidents that is happening in our countries it will be something that the prime minister needs to be aware of use the structures that exist exercise those structures in advance and to Iona's point um, in terms of if Australia's government is going to step in um, it's absolutely not the case that they will always step in this is a power of last resort and so that goes back to uh, the the uh, first point which is have those pre-existing relationships and a plan including potentially with a private sector provider to provide that incident response thank you thank you so much really grateful also for um covering the question in the chat and and we need to conclude the part number one i've really um invite everyone to thank me all the four uh, experts in a really interesting perspective. Um, but we'll be also working on the report to provide all the links that the experts have um, announced. So for the wider, wider public to be more informed about different efforts taking place in those countries. Thank you so much. Um, I will move to the second part to discuss the international uh, cooperation component. And that's to explore opportunities for the UN Cyber Emergency Phone Book, which I'd like to stress doesn't exist. This is something that we try to um, find a catchy word and thus to reflect the idea if this possibility for um, formal and informal mechanisms to cooperate between states and uh, non-state act actors in the event um, of the cyber incident effective critical infrastructure in different jurisdictions. So we Honored to have with us today the following experts, Mr. Serge Dro uh, from Board of Directors at first, representing actually, I think, the unique global CERT CSER community. Then also Ms. Corbin Corbin, head of the Contra Cybercrime Programming at the Global Program on uh, Cybercrime at UNDC. And Mr. Pedacher, Senior Security Researcher at the Global Research and Analysis Team, uh, Greg Kaspersky, to represent mostly the perspective of the private sector and the private security researchers today. So we also have the three uh, core questions today, and I'd like to announce the first one. Uh, let's imagine that is an affected state by the cyber incident and the critical infrastructure in that state is an, affected by the cyber incident. And that state or the owner of the critical infrastructure doesn't have the capacities to respond. Who should it approach for help? And what does the UN Cyber Stability Framework suggest doing in this regard? So I'd like to start first with the Mr. Uh, Serge Droz, then to pass to Carmen, and then to Pierre. Thank you. Thank you, Anastasia. Um, my name is Serge Droz, as you said. I'm the, on the board of first the form of instance response and security teams. And, and we are kind of really the umbrella organization that brings together all these instance responders not only from governments, but also from the private sector and academia. And I think that there's, you mentioned in your question, what if a state is affected that doesn't have the capability or the capacity to, to react to this? And I would argue that probably most national sea certs today, sooner or later run into limits where they can't handle an, an incident anymore. First of all, because they don't have access to the infrastructure that's affected. 
remember most of the critical infrastructure is actually operated by private sector organizations and it's very rare that they're operated by uh, by the government or a state itself so that team will have to reach out to other teams now in what at first we we promote is not only that every state has a CSERT or national CSERT, but that it has a national CSERT community. And that those communities probably should be of regional nature because if, if you're affected in a smaller country, there's a good chance that your neighboring country will suffer from the attack too. And so to answer, to answer your question, what I feel should happen is that if a national CSER runs into a trouble, it needs to reach out within its CSER community to other teams that may be able to help. That is, is absolutely crucial. If you believe you can have a national team that can solve all of it, you probably you probably lost. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Noted. And I think in this regard, at least two non-binary norms would be activated. The norm about the request and assistance and the norm about the uh, cooperation between certs and providing the flow to cooperation between them. Thank you so much. Uh, Carmen, would you also like to share perspective? Yes, thank you. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this panel. I'm, I'm really happy to join today with the other experts and to listen to the first panel of experts that gave so many really wonderful perspectives. So as you mentioned, I am the head of uh, UNODC's uh, counter cybercrime programming that we are doing in Western Central Africa. And so I am posted currently in Dakar. And before I came to Senegal and to the UN, my, my first career was as a cyber prosecutor in the United States. So I have um, over 11 years of working as a cyber prosecutor, specifically on all types of cyber crimes and dealing with digital evidence. And I raise this because I'm really uh, seeing a lot of what this discussion is today about relationship building and how to react to an emergency incident uh, and how that is actually applicable and, and uh, a reality in what we're facing in Africa and the work that we're doing in West and Central Africa, but really across the globe. As Serge said just a moment ago, really all certs in any country probably at some point are going to face a situation that they may not be prepared for. And they're going to need to reach to other experts or other private public partner relationships to help get through the experience or, or solve the issue. So I think the two major things that we highlight in the work that we're doing in West and Central Africa, but as our program as a whole across the globe, really focusing on capacity building, training, training for understanding, uh, you know, on, on digital evidence and, and cyber uh, investigations and prosecutions, but relationship building. Relationship building is critical. And uh, as Serge, I want to underline exactly what he said. This is internal to countries between public and private entities, but also regional. It is especially critical. We see it here in West and Central Africa that regional uh, relationships and knowing who points of contact are in other countries, whether it be a neighboring country or someone in the region that would be reachable for assistance or collaboration if an emergency incident occurs is really, really critical. And uh, so these are two of the aspects that we really focus on a lot in our work here. Thank you so much for the comprehensive overview and a very brief one of what the UN NDC does in this regard. Uh, Pierre, um, the floor is yours to share the perspective of the private sector. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nastia. Thanks for the opportunity to discuss uh, this point. Uh, I would say it depends on uh, a lot of factors. Um, well, starting by what is the response term uh, meaning, uh, the affected states or activity sectors, uh, requesting states memberships, uh, existing memberships, and requesting organization uh, of such state. But various defined options and uh, frameworks already exist to request help, uh, such as the regional CSERT communities or cooperation mechanisms like uh, the EGC and the NIS Directive Cooperation Mechanisms uh, for the European Union, um, maybe regional crisis and incident response mechanisms, uh, be it cyber focused or not, like the IPCR arrangements, the Argus high level cross sectoral uh, crisis coordination process, or the EEAS crisis response system for the European Union. 
There's also um, multilateral uh, cooperation bodies at uh, CSERT state or military levels, like the TFCSERT, the first, the IWWN, or NATO even. And of course, uh, additional uh, bilateral agreements and cooperation frameworks may exist. Uh, but to my knowledge, nothing which is uh, fully international by nature and which is cyber specific in us uh, already exists. Uh, for such a case. So this is just to illustrate uh, possibilities because the state may also decide to uh, approach various organizations, including private ones, international body or states, however uh, it deems fit and out of any existing framework, depending on uh, the circumstance of the attack or the crisis, uh, of course. And uh, questions now are, uh, can any state in the world benefit from at least uh, one of such existing cooperation frameworks? Uh, are existing frameworks sufficiently uh, fit, tried and test and trusted to be enabled in such case? And could uh, enabling whichever of such existing frameworks be read as an offense or threat by any other uh, state? I don't believe that there are existing frameworks today which can uh, cover all of these three questions with, uh, let's say, favorable answers. And I also sincerely don't know what uh, the UN cyber stability framework is suggesting in uh, such a case. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Still, um, it's really great to, to hear, actually, the part of the answers um, are the same for all the free speakers. It actually, I think, positively indicates that it's still the same structures that we all are aware of and what they could currently already leverage and use. Um, but going further in the um, aspects of the limitations, why some of the theoretically positive and the efficient mechanism may not still be existing. Um, the question is, why can be done in this regard? And specifically to achieve that stronger cooperation with, uh, between the sort sort community and how the neutrality of the sorts could be ensured in this regard. And in the meantime, answer, uh, hearing the questions, answers of the speakers, I also would like to send the link, as I mentioned, to the session of the neutrality and the research uh, done by uh, the ATH Zurich about the law of neutrality in cyberspace, which specifically talks about the neutrality of the private actors and the CSERT. Maybe it also could be helpful for the audience. So Serge, the floor is yours. <sighs> Sorry, can you rephrase the question? Sure, absolutely. What can be done for stronger cooperation between sites and how to ensure the neutrality? Okay, so, sorry, it was a, kind of a busy day today. Um, I think what's really important is that that states take to face value that that C search or instance responders should just focus on their very own role, on, on the one role they're designed to do, and that's responding to instance. They should not be part of any, any other activities, such as kind of attribution, for example, or even offensive capabilities. Why? Because if you're starting to deal with, with someone that, say, does attribution, then other states may not willingly collaborate because you never really know if, if this actually pays back. So I think it's it's very important to have a clear role, understanding of the roles and responsibilities of all the involved actors. And and sadly, we often see situations where, where either a CSER team feels I'm more important than the other one because I'm, I'm a, a national CSER or I'm from a big corporation. So and that just doesn't really work out. You, we, we need to get away from this and really continue improving trust. And that may mean that certain states kind of take a step back and start working with people they, they don't really like. And that, of course, is a big challenge. But again, I think that challenge can be overcome by, by really kind of focusing on the role. It's, and we, we do this in other areas, like in disaster relief, for example, if, if even some area has, a, has kind of a big earthquake, there's no questions of, of rescue teams from countries not really on speaking terms, working side on side. But in, in cyber, we don't we don't have that concept yet. And I think it's very, very important to move this this way. And that's also, I think, one of the reasons why I think 
first is really a great organization because we do have members from pretty much any any kind of political block or so we have the national sea suits of china russia pretty much every european country and the us in there and they talk to each other and, and that is the principle i think we need to foster and, and continue promoting thank you thank you i think it's quite optimistic to hear and positive to hear about this Carmen, uh, the question to you as well about the stronger cooperation between cis rights and the possibility for more neutrality to ensure more neutrality for them. Sure. So, um, you know, again, I can speak from our own experience here and the work that we're doing in Africa and West Africa. So one of the ways that we work, especially to build these relationships and to build, because of course, with relationships, you have more of an opportunity, more of probably a realistic reality of cooperation. Um, is we have regional events where we bring cybersecurity experts or members of certs from different countries and the regions that we cover and the countries that we cover to come together to work on you know, these issues for capacity building work, for conference work. Um, and also just recently, if, uh, last month, we actually held a conference that was a regional conference that included some tabletop exercises. And again, it was a a fake incident where there's an attack on a national bank, but it's a process by which it allows different uh, cyber experts from these different countries to have to react in, a, in an active way to an incident that is, you know, allegedly happening in their country. And it allows them to then, in a very safe space, uh, talk about how they would react to these things, how they could work together, how they would share information within their region between these countries uh, to combat the problem that they're, they're facing. And so it's from this on the ground sort of work that we're doing regionally in, in the, the areas that we are working around the world that we're trying to build this collaboration and these relationships in a very, I would say, a simple way, in the way of basically just having the people be across the table from one another, or, you know, under the pandemic, it is also sometimes across the computer screen, unfortunately, like we are right now, but it still is allowing people to see each other and talk to each other and recognize that, um, you know, many of these countries, they, they, they do have a cert, or even if they do not have a cert, there are cybersecurity experts that are in place in different you know, whether they're in law enforcement or other agencies within the governments, that can be the point of contact for this type of collaboration and international cooperation. This type of relationship will always be key, I think, for an emergency situation, for de-escalating the situation, and then for moving forward with an actual investigation and prosecution. These relationships between countries, private public relationships are really going to be key. And, and our partners too at Interpol, they have also a large program that is in Africa where they're trying to also work in the same ways of uh, building networks and capacity building in cybercrime. Um, and I'm other, I won't speak any further about that in particular, but you can go in and research that online. And um, so there's a lot of us that are working in the same field to try to really build up these connections um, around the world. Thank you so much. And also for highlighting the role of the Interpol in this regard, I, I, I see that we also have the director Jones from Interpol. He is with us. Maybe he could also like to share the perspective of that. Of course, we keep in mind that the, the cybercrime and the issues ensuring the international security and peace are two parallel, but still separate the process within the, the first and the third committee. Um, but it could be interesting to know if actually the same mechanisms might be used in the end of the cyber incident, especially when we don't know yet what's actually the cyber incidents is about and what we're dealing with. So I think they definitely could be a lot of the overlapping mechanisms in this regard. But Pierre, um, over to you for sharing the perspective of the private sector as well. Yes, yeah, so what can be done to uh, achieve stronger cooperation and how can the neutrality of CISOD be ensured? Then uh, one of the lessons learned I kept from uh, my past experiences as a major, major uh, incidents responder and as an international uh, affairs officer is that uh, cooperation does not uh, strengthen or even happen uh, as a result of any single specific action, whoever uh, the initiator of the action may be. Uh, broad and effective cooperation, as well as uh, its developments, are 
a result of multiple factors, which uh, apart the will to cooperate uh, necessarily include common grounds, goals, or issues, uh, commitment, mutual understanding, uh, supplementary or uh, compatible capabilities, clear outcomes or explicit successes, time, and I believe uh, before, uh, before anything else, trust. Uh, trust between uh, parties, but also trust uh, between individuals. And as a result, uh, to me, building or strengthening cooperation is first and uh, continuously building trust. And there are no uh, magic recipes to do so. This is achieved by trying to face and experience various uh, common situations and issues over time. This is enabled or eased uh, by various means, uh, including uh, openly stating the will to cooperate and the benefit to do so. This is always starting from there. Uh, knowing each other by setting uh, arbitrary meetings or call schedules or agendas, exercise events to discuss with uh, more and more freedom and uh, sincerity, uh, understanding and committing to each other, for instance, uh, with uh, staff exchange, uh, so that one can truly learn and discover from uh, the day-to-day -day work of the other and try to bring something to it or with uh, capacity building also, uh, setting common definition or key concepts. This could, for instance, be defining uh, what is a global critical infrastructure, uh, setting a reasonable amount of both practical common goals and bold goals as a program so that everyone can start trying to reach a common success openly sharing uh, operational information to each other as a token of uh, goodwill, and uh, daring to ask for help in the event of a difficult situation as a will to build a practical common ground and as an opportunity to face uh, issues uh, more easily. And uh, to enable anticipation and lessons learned before any real operational need arise, then this can all be experienced experience through uh, proofs of concept, take any part of a broad or global issue, uh, let's agree to try tackling it for real as much as possible during a given time frame, gather willing forces and go with any options uh, I listed. Then as regards um, CSERT's neutrality, uh, then again, it depends on what neutrality means. Uh, CSERTs have a, a common mission to understand, investigate, and remediate uh, cybersecurity incidents. But they all do so for their constituency first, uh, be it a state, uh, a private corporation, or customers. And as so, they will never be uh, absolutely neutral in the sense they will probably always work with their uh, organization uh, as a priority, uh, by mindset and by design. But that's not necessarily an issue because when uh, cooperating, only the common goals uh, remain as a common priority. And as um, uh, Gregory Bateson, uh, Bertalanfi, or any systemics practitioner would emphasize, any system is a set of individual items, but is not limited uh, to it. Quite interesting angle. Thank you so much. Um, so we actually hear, again, the the mostly common the answers and the most common the elements of the answer. Serge highlighted a focus on the role should be that important element to stick to the role and thus ensuring the stronger cooperation between CSERTs and ensuring the neutrality. Um, Carmen also said about the loss of the cooperation and collaboration in this regard. And Pierre, I think you also stressed on the trust building and experience and already all together the some cyber exercises and thus actually this could be a necessary well, the experience helping us together what did work, what didn't work, and how we could improve our cooperation in the future. But I think also trust is also relies on the personal relationships between the different people. So the question would be how to formalize uh, the cooperation between the institutions beyond the particular um, context and particular um, expert. Um, if the cyber attack affects critical infrastructure, again, in several jurisdictions, and if cross-border cooperation could be possible? Um, if yes, how? What are the formal and informal mechanisms? First of all, we need to keep in mind in this regard. So I'd like to uh, pass the floor again first to Serge, then Carmen and Pierre. So I, I've, I've been thinking a lot about how to create trust and foster trust. And, and I've always come to the conclusion trust is, a, is an inherently human thing. And it's very, very difficult to kind of disassociate this from human and institutionalize this. 
at the end of the day, it's always about people kind of working together that, that have a past history. And in my experience, you, you build, people always say it's very difficult to build trust. And I kind of agree, but not, not 100%, because I think you can start quite easily by, by starting on a simple problem. You collaborate, this is, you, you send a simple request for help. You don't send another team a request that, that involves loads of confidential data and, and, and is really tricky and has political components. You, you really start low and, and working together, this is how you build up trust. I feel this is a, is a very, very important thing to do. And, and I think if, if teams continue working together on a regular basis, then actually the trust can be extended to a team. So just being associated with a certain team uh, then means that, that whoever you collaborate with is going to trust you a little bit more. So in, in, so I think the goal would be to, to start with individual trust and then expand this to, to entire teams. But that means for a lot of security people to a little bit overcome their egos because it means bringing in junior people into the conversation and not just keep everything themselves. And it's also a challenge because a lot of security people or a lot of technical people are kind of shy. So you need to be a little bit outgoing, be able to talk to others. Again, the trust is a human thing. So all the human factors play in. But I think we know how to build, we all have friends, hopefully. And, and I think uh, it's really the same mechanisms here. Start building friends. Thank you. Thank you. Quite an optimistic way, uh, uh, Carmen. Yeah, I mean, I, I keep uh, saying, I think generally the same sort of concept, but it really comes down to cyber diplomacy, kind of like what Serge is saying. It comes down to, obviously, you need people in uh, certs and in positions that deal with cyber attacks to technically know what they're doing and, and how to solve the problem. But you also need people that are able to be good communicators. And there needs to be a willingness to share information and to share um, skills, if that's possible. And so, again, with our program at UNODC's Global Program on Cybercrime, we are trying to create possibilities for these trusting relationships or the beginnings of these relationships to, to start um, by capacity building work, where we're bringing different people from different countries together, where they're learning together, they're training together. Sometimes they're even assisting each other, different countries assisting each other on cybercrime uh, investigations and training. So with these ideas and these events, we're working to try to build these relationships, these trusting contacts, and that diplomacy, that ability to communicate with one another uh, and willingness to do so, because ultimately that is going to be key to solving this really huge issue that we have globally. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carmen. Pierre? Uh, well, to get back on your question about uh, uh, is cross-border cooperation possible and in, in the initial um, topic of uh, uh, this discussion about the, the cyber emergency phone book. Uh, I believe, of course, that uh, cross-border um, and even cross-anything cooperation is possible. And um, it, it is, uh, in any way, absolutely necessary. Uh, as obvious as it is already, I believe it is still useful to state it again. Uh, cyberspace is by design and by fact a cross-border asset that exists from uh, interdependencies only. Any state or organization can decide and try to manage uh, for its own small and incomplete part of it. But any action on cyberspace as a whole is uh, global by nature and is only possible uh, from cross-border cooperation. Uh, then because of this, um, and as far as I know from my experience as well, there are almost none of such cyber attacks or incidents which are strictly bound uh, to a single uh, autonomous system and all by the same organization. So attackers have several targets, sometimes on several countries, rely on uh, infrastructure all over the cyberspace and leverage assets that originally belong to several organizations. So cyber attacks are somehow uh, global by nature as well. And lastly, uh, victims of a cyber attack and organizations that are affected by a cybersecurity incident often provide services or goods 
uh, which somehow are at least um, are, um, have dependency on other organizations and services. So incidence perimeters are uh, most likely uh, to be broader than first seen by initial uh, responders. And a cyber attack or cybersecurity incident would most likely be global by nature, but response is almost never. Uh, what an unbalanced uh, situation we put ourselves in, actually. And the results of the current way to, to handle um, cyber attacks and cybersecurity incidents speak uh, for themselves. Uh, those who can barely manage um, to contain or remediate uh, on limited parameters, others simply can't. Some then go straight away to attribution and political escalation, and hopefully the overall cyber readiness is uh, better following regulation and past incidents, but it's still not good enough to make more cyber attacks uh, difficult, while cyber attacks are not more limited or less frequent than before. So yes, I believe cross-border cooperation um, must be possible and should bring uh, better results that zoos uh, we already have. But for this to be possible, I believe we must be ready uh, by building trust and preparing cooperation frameworks, uh, just as discussed uh, previously in, in, in this um, framework and discussion. Uh, a UN emergency fund book is a good start and, and could surely be done easily by leveraging existing cooperation mechanism. I think about first, for instance, uh, and, but this will surely um, need to go further uh, right away. Yeah, and I agree with you, Pia. Um, it would be really definitely at a good case, and especially if the such a UN cyber emergency phone book, a global repository of the global context, could be officially somehow centralized and the existing right now. So I think it would be quite really helpful, especially to countries who do not have those capacities in them, small countries. But I I understood that the the ability of the country to respond to the request coming from the another country is actually being rely on the how much this country is successful with uh, the domestic approaches and having all the domestic structure, structured approaches to ensure the critical infrastructure, build the teams, allocate the resources. And also if uh, speaking at the, the fact that the critical infrastructure protection is uh, sectoral and if the, at least at the national level, the sectoral uh, cooperation is possible, then beyond one nation, the more cross-border cooperation, I think also would be more possible in this regard. Before we close the session, I also would like to provide the floor to um, Director Jones. Um, it's really great to hear, to see you and also to hear the perspective coming from law enforcement and global law enforcement. So floor is yours. Thanks very much. And very conscious of the time, Anastasia, really interesting conversation. Um, what's just come through very clearly then is, is the trust element. Um, and how do we trust then as a global community uh, in this space? Interpol, 195 member countries, neutral organization, we're trying to engineer that, that trust model that we can share um, criminal data sets and information. But what we're looking at here across the piece is vulnerabilities within our networks and our systems that criminals or other actors take advantage of. So sharing first of all about the vulnerabilities and identification and mitigation of those. Um, looking at how FIRST operates as well, so very much we're trying to work with FIRST now to draw together that community, learn from each other and share, and about cooperation. We look at those criminal acts effectively and trying to coordinate that between countries. We look at those geopolitical angles and very much we're still working in that geopolitical context in law enforcement. But I'd also sort of ask and look at the CERT communities about what do you do with that information, that sort of cutting room floor information which you gain, where it's not a state attack, but you get a lot of information there that is related to criminal acts. How do you share that then nationally, but also how do we then share that out internationally as well? So I think there's another important element that we need to look at here as well within this conversation. So I've, I've said enough because of the time. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to come in. Um, really interesting uh, field discussion here. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I also like the perspective on the data sharing, which I think is also the hot topic within the each government to define the access to data and also the possibilities the for data sharing between private and public partners, between the law enforcement and so on. 
Thank you so much to all the experts. We need to conclude the session. I really hope that you find the discussions useful. Um, as I hope it could be one more step forward to having a better understanding globally how the critical infrastructure protection taking place, how what the regulatory approaches are in this regard, and how uh, we may have further insights coming from the UN level, especially between the new uh, open ended working group starts next week. So thank you so much. Um, again, please um, uh, join me uh, thinking in all our experts, uh, Serge, Carmen, Pierre, um, I hope you would have a really productive day further at the UN Internet Governance Forum. And thank you so much. It was really great to see you all.